I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about one of my absolute favorite subjects, the Grateful Dead's influence on modern media, music, and culture, I have with us a bona fide expert, a practitioner, a fellow Tulane graduate, Jonathan Shank, who is the CEO and founder of Terrapin Station Entertainment, which is a division of Sony. Jonathan, I, I'm going to introduce you for a second here. You were the first ever intern at New Orleans House of Blues in 1994, which is big street cred among our crowd. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I think about the the times at the House of Blues in New Orleans, and there was that what an amazing lineup of shows that they had rolling through there in those early days of 94, 95. Yeah. Do you ever see the meters there? I mean, because that was... A hundred times. Right. You know, and yeah. I've seen George Porter a, a thousand times, probably, and no exaggeration. Yeah. I actually inducted him into the Bass Player Hall of Fame uh, at the Bass Player Magazine uh, ceremony. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's years amazing. Ago. Yeah, and one of the high honors of, of my life. But I will say, you know, just because you made me think of it with the House of Blues is one of the coolest things I did was I got to see a lot of the sound checks. And Bill Monroe played at the House of Blues, New Orleans, in the early yeah. days. And I remember strolling in. By the way, my glamorous job at the House of Blues was to hang the flyers in the bathrooms and in, like, the ancillary areas. But... Uh, you know, what I did get to experience was the sound checks and so many of the dead's influential musicians, you know, rolled through there in that 94, 95 period. The band with Levon Danko and, and Garth was Garth, you know, still, still, yeah. in, in, still there. Right. And then you had Bill Monroe, you had a couple of nights of the original rat dog with, with Jay and Rob, right? Like there was just so much happening. Clapton, Dylan, two nights of Dylan in the house of blues, right? The almonds with, with Dickie and Warren and when Alan Woody was still alive, yeah. you know, on, on base. I mean, just an unbelievable uh, lineup that they had there. It was just, it was had to be one of the hottest venues in the country at that moment. Oh, no question. And, and like, you know, the only one that was a parallel in terms of house of blues to me was, you know, the original in Chicago and the one in LA to me, those didn't even compare because of what you just said. I mean, you graduated a few years after I did, but we were both in New Orleans during that absolute heyday of the Neville brothers, the radiators, the meters, Dr. John, Irma Thomas, Cyril Neville and the Uptown All-Stars, you know, all the all the different offshoots of all that. I mean, I remember, you know, there was Snooks, Snooks Eaglin. It's the great uh, the, the, me, the meters at Muddy Waters, I remember. And then, of course, you know, the kind of emergence and creation of the funky meters with Russell, Batiste, rest in peace. And Brian. And Art and Brian, exactly. Yeah. And that, that really was an amazing incarnation of the band that just was, yeah, I mean, on fire in the 90s. Listeners of the, this podcast know this, but I lived around the corner from the Neville brothers where they grew up. I was on camp street. They were on Valance, of course. And I lived around the corner from RT and he kind of took me under my, under his wing and Cyril did too. Cyril helped us get Tulane students against apartheid to help get Tulane to consider divest. And so those guys, I owe so much to their mentorship and, you know, art, may he rest in peace. Aaron Neville was just on this podcast with his new book. I heard out. And uh, that was really fun. It, th that was a treat. If anybody hasn't read Tell It Like It Is yet, you're really in for a treat because you'll learn so much that you didn't know. There's a lot in that book that you didn't know. I promise you that. I'm sure you remember seeing JD and the Jammers perform at, at Benny's down the street from my house. Of course. I mean, we used to, yeah, I mean, all of that stuff. We used to do Maple Leaf, Rebirth Maple Leaf all the time. And everything you mentioned, in addition to... Rock and Bowl. I remember Snooks and Porter a lot at Rock and Bowl, Mid City, and also those early incarnations of Porter and the Running Partners. We what would become Bonarama or parts of Bonarama, and we actually have a lot of those recordings on DAT or on other formats that would love to transfer at some point. We have we definitely have a lot of you know digital boards from those days that need to be revisited. Some of which we maybe put on CD, but now those CDs need to be put into digital. So yeah, th those, 
times there and and also just the every year Neville's headlining, you know, Jazz Fest and and finishing Sunday evening. Those House of Blues shows with Neville's during Mardi Gras were epic. Oh, uh, I remember. And the and the initial given credit where credit's due, the initial Superfly shows that were set up during that time. The you know when when they started bringing in Bella Fleck and and some of those other other shows were really that was a really um, I would say just just formative time for not just New Orleans music, but for the jam scene. Hundred percent for the jam scene, and that, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about is, you know, the jam scene, the dead New Orleans, so many scenes around the country. I think we have a mutual friend in Peter Shapiro who, you know, once said to me, "You can go into any town in America on a Friday night, and you can find a dead cover band playing somewhere." Tell us what your company does and how the Grateful Dead and their business practices informed what you're doing today with your company in Los Angeles and really around the world? Yeah, there's a lot of layers there. I think it's important to probably first say that when I was working with Mickey Hart a handful of years ago, he really was the deepest influence on me to push to become an event producer and to really continue to branch out beyond just being a manager. And so that really was the foundation of calling the company Terrapin Station. You know, Terrapin to me always represented a place where all of these mythical characters could congregate and hang out and kind of like the um, canteen in Star Wars, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it was like the dead's version of that canteen and, and, and we're all the characters. Uh, we used to like to say we're in the business of collecting characters and Terrapin yeah. Station was kind of where all the characters hung out. <laughs> And it was also really something that song specifically was something that was had a lot of meaning to me. So it just connected a lot of dots and felt meaningful when the company started. What's happened since then is, you know, been able to really produce a lot of family entertainment uh, shows with Disney, with various Nickelodeon properties like Peppa Pig and Octonauts and all of the family entertainment that comes along with that. And then also developing immersive experiences like the Bob Marley experience, or, you know, that I worked on with the Marley family. So there's been a lot of like, you know, our kind of motto is just to be open-minded about working on all different kinds of projects. I did traditional music management for almost 15 years and, you know, really have found that bringing all these skill sets together from marketing to promotion to creative development is really where our sweet spot is. And so uh, finding these global brands, no different than the Grateful Dead, just maybe not focused in improvisational music, but all of these projects start with the core audience. And that is the most common you know, denominator between whether you're talking about Mickey Mouse or whether you're talking about the Grateful Dead, it all starts with a really strong core base and then being able to engage that base. And so a lot of the ethos that we work from come from the you know understanding that you're serving a core fan base. That's it's fascinating. And I wanted to one of the questions I wanted to ask you is why is post pandemic live music so important and so back in American society. It feels like it's come back stronger than ever. Think about how desperate we were during the pandemic just to grab that feeling. We were willing to be on Zooms at any given time just to see an acoustic song because people couldn't even get together in the same room at first or watch shows where bands were performing in front of no one. I think about how much was lost you know, from I'm not talking about from a fiscal standpoint, I'm just talking strictly from a, an emotional standpoint, that that connection had been taken away with the pandemic. And so I think that just like anything else in life, when you get that kind of perspective, it, it allows you to really appreciate something on the other side. And, and I think that the rest of this decade and probably beyond is going to be spent in this deep appreciation mode for experiential for live music for immersive for any type of entertainment that or not even entertainment it could could actually just be engagement like competitive socializing 
mini golf, top golf, monopoly immersive, other types of things. But these forms of entertainment are all going to continue to grow over the next handful of years because of the starved nature of what the pandemic provided during that time without, you know, that line of emotional connectivity. Yeah, you know, these days, a lot of people worry about social media and how it has an isolating effect or how it, how it can have an isolating effect. But I think what you're saying and what the, the results of live participation are is that maybe we're not as isolated as we thought and maybe we're craving those communities that you're seeking to engage. It's all an evolution and, and where we're going to take the conversation is maybe something that's, that's one layer deeper. But I think there's an argument to be made that the first ever social network was the Grateful Dead. And if you actually were to spend a lot of time diving into this and understanding, okay, first ever fan newsletter, right? Well, what was that? That was social networking. Okay, first ever tracking of like shows and set lists and, and all of those types of things. First, first tape trading. What was that? Tape trading was a social network. Where were the first ever social networks born? The Bay Area. Okay. These are not coincidences, in my opinion. Okay. The, the first ever, you, you know, social, there were core fan bases, the Beatles, Elvis, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali, right? There was other incredible core fan bases that existed prior to the Grateful Dead. Those fan bases at that time were not socializing amongst one another in the same way that the Grateful Dead's were. They weren't, sh they weren't sharing anything with each other. They weren't sharing. And so to me, what we're experiencing now in terms of the passing of information through social media and misinformation is really an evolution of what started with that, you know, trend and, and pattern throughout building a core fan base. And, and what is what is TikTok? It is a collection of core fan bases. That's all it really is. And people that have contemporized how to build them. In our media, what else do you see in terms of the dead's influence? I mean, one of the interesting things is the dead never made any real money on recorded music. And nowadays, of course, with streaming, most artists don't make any real money in recording albums or recording songs unless it's something that is, you know, billions of streams. How did the dead sort of make a living and, and how do you see artists making a living now in this environment where you can't really make a lot of money recording music? 85%, I, I think 85% of, of an artist's living is through live engagement at this point or some ancillary stream that occurred through their live engagement, like VIP, sponsorship, merchandise, et cetera. And I would argue, I'm not sure on the recording side what an artist like Taylor Swift is making, but that proportionally she's making much more on her touring than she is from her recorded music catalog, yeah. which I'm sure is incredibly valuable. But the, you know, multiples, you know, in the way that she is shifting the economy in certain markets is driven by the touring. But I think that's, you know, ultimately where an artist is going to have to really stand out is that they're going to have to be some something that an audience wants to gather around and something that's unique. That's really where I believe all art is heading. And I believe that that's really what people are gravitating towards. What, when you say all art, um, can you expand on that a bit? Like, what do you mean? I think it's not just music. I think it's, it's you know, other forms of art as well. And, and, you know, be that theater or immersive, which I believe is one of the fastest growing forms of entertainment. And I think it just affects, affects everything. Yeah. Give me a sense of where immersive is right now in the marketplace and how do people, you know, tend to access it? I believe that, the international market in immersive is pretty far ahead of where we are here in North America. I've seen and heard of some pretty incredible experiences that are happening right now. One called Mundo, Mundo Pixar, which is the world of Pixar. 
and just being able to think about the catalog of films, a canon of films that a, that a studio like that has, and then uh, you know the fan base and being able to go out and kind of feel that, you know, be in that environment with Monsters Inc. with these various characters, I think is is amazing. And you know, even take that again, all based on core fan bases to Ferrari to the Van Gogh exhibit to, you know, we're actually producing a Pixar themed uh, mini golf course, you know, so we're excited about that. And I believe that people want to spend their time and resources engaging with others and doing fun things and less on buying pashmina scarves. At least that's what we're betting on. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so right. So the big bet is on the experience rather than something material and maybe some material things or is is merchandise that goes along with these experiences but the but the fundamental thing that you're seeing which harkens back again to the grateful dead is it's the experience absolutely and research shows that younger generations are all about the experience and are are a bit less material there are some really interesting trends out there that support that and, and look at the emergence of the festival culture here in North America, right? Look at how many soft ticket events are able to be supported in this country alone, let alone the international market. But yeah, I mean, I think that there is a massive movement towards just more competitive socializing also, like these cool adults only mini golf courses. I think they're called swingers um, in a handful of markets, London, New York, et cetera. Uh, there, there's just, I think a lot of really good examples. I was actually at Top Golf yesterday. To me, that's all a version of immersive and a, a version of competitive social you know, engagement, et cetera. And that trickles up to live music. That trickles straight up to the live music world. And that same audience who is engaging in that way or is the same audience that's going to buy tickets to Bonnaroo or Coachella, to Dead & Co, to go see Fish at the Sphere, et cetera. Hopefully to come to Jazz Fest. And absolutely to come back to Jazz Fest because there really isn't a better spring summer festival than Jazz Fest in New Orleans. Always, always the last weekend in April, the first weekend in May, expanded dates now. Both Thursdays are now involved, which is really cool. So I also think that one of the things that is really interesting is, you know, when we talk about community, the Grateful Dead has had, you know, generations of community. Deadheads love the music. They revere the music. They also revere the sense of community that has been around the Grateful Dead and now Dead and Company, even Billy and the Kids, Bobby Ware's band, Wolf Brothers, you see new jam bands popping up, you know, that are really popular. Of course, there's J-Rad, but one of the ones that I'm getting interested in is, is you know, how does how did Goose form this community already around them that seems to be just pushing them upward and upward and upward? How do young bands go out and form communities? Let's just call it right out there. The music's good. Starts with that, I think. And what's amazing to me about this story, and, and Ben Baruch is somebody that I've known for 25 years. And I'm just so happy to see him having so much success. And he's a brilliant executive. And I love the fact that he does it the way that he wants to do it. You know, it's really admirable. And I have so much respect for for him and what this band is doing. And I love talking about it because it gives me hope that this scene and this music is going to be able to carry on for the next 30 years, uh, 40 years, however many years it's going to be. And that feeling of hope, you know, that there is going to be something that can develop organically like this, that is all about the music, that is that I think people are excited about this community because it feels fresh, feels good. And also between 2002 and 2020, let's call it when Goose emerged in the pandemic and Billy Strings emerged in the pandemic, there was nothing new for us in this scene to hang our hat on. 
just unbelievable feeling of hope and positivity that comes along with that. And I think everybody, like the same way that, I don't know, maybe this is a bad analogy, but like when like Lady Gaga hit and like the Recording Academy was like lifting her up, you know, on the pedestal, it's like, I think everybody in the jam community is like, wants to lift this up. I certainly want to be part of that, that gospel, right? And, and I think a lot of people do, just in, in a very pure way of saying, check this out, this is good. And it's not about the party or the whatever, it's, it's about the music and these guys are having fun. And they certainly have a formula of figuring out how to engage fans. And my only question for them is how it feels every time when they come on stage and everybody is saying goose, you know, and if you're not a fan, you're going, why is everybody doing these guys when they're coming on stage? <laughs> you know, for everybody whose first show it is. <laughs> yeah. You're like, and there's, there's, you know, thousands of people out here booing these guys. that haven't even played a note of music. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. I love it. And that's the community. That's it right there. That's I I love that. It reminds me of, you know, the 92 language lesson with Trey and it reminds me of, you know, take a step back and it reminds me of, you know, some of those quintessential things that are the things that bring us together as a as a scene like who doesn't love that when the band comes on stage? What do you do? Everybody yells goose, you know, you know, like twist, right? Like I was in Europe in 97 for the first ever twist. And I went back and it was in, it was in Dublin, Ireland in mid June of 97. Hundreds. There was not a thousand people showed the hundreds of people that were in attendance for the show. By the way, first ghost, first twist. Yeah. There were the, the show that was like thinking back on it, it was like really, you know, kind of classic fish show thinking back on that now. Nobody knew to say twist in that show because it was the first one ever. But then by summer 97, there was the, the woo, you know, during that and, and how that's evolved into a crowd favorite and, and an interactive moment. And that's, that's what Goose is bringing is they're bringing those, they're, they're, they're bringing that energy. And now they have the cosign from the dead and from fish. And, and it's, um, it's really nice to see that, that, exist it sure is i mean people have been talking about the death of rock and roll since the grunge scene kind of wrapped up and for people who enjoy jam band type music it's most certainly not dead it's more alive than it's been in a very long time and it is hopeful super hopeful I think it's going to just continue building. I'd actually, I, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, which we already are, Goose and Billy Strings headline some of these more mainstream festivals and really build their their bases beyond, you know, build their communities beyond the jam scene. And, and what's so incredible is an artist like Billy Strings, if our listeners aren't familiar, he's playing bluegrass music. He's playing old Appalachian music. It's extraordinary the kind of fan base that he's building among young people. People always ask too, and, and, and you know I've been interested in this for a while, is we've got new generations of deadheads popping up every turn of a generation. Like there's currently, there's no other band that's quite like this where Jerry Garcia died 30 years ago. And you've got, really, you've got a bunch of kids who are now 15, 16, 17, 18, who are drifting to the dead's music and transporting that whole feeling of jam band music, Americana roots music forward. Why do you think the dead keep bringing new generations to their music versus a band like the Rolling Stones that kind of just has its same old fan base? There was a period of time. Okay. Let's talk about this historically and chronologically. Okay. In the two thousands, where the dead weren't the most in favor act. Okay. The merchandise was not the way it is now. There was the, the licensing was not the way it is now. I mean, you have grateful dead, you have grateful merchandise on just about everything from camping equipment to surfboards, to high end fashion, yeah. to towels, to bathing suits. I mean, flip-flops, whatever it is. Well, you know, you think about this, okay, The Dead had a tour in 09. It was marginally successful. It was successful, but it wasn't a stadium tour or, or it wasn't at that level. It was a successful arena run. And then 
during that period between 09 and Fare Thee Well, I believe you had a nice swell happen during that time and a bit of a perfect storm of like Bobby coming back to health, the question whether Bobby was going to come back to health properly, the relationship between Phil and Bob, and then all of that swelling up towards 15 with the, you know, fare thee well on the 50th anniversary and then doing, you know, a really good job of all of the licensing that happened around that. I think in some ways reinvigorated everybody's energy. And then right off the back end of that, having Dead & Co., the people that couldn't experience Fare Thee Well were able to experience Dead & Co. And then it was like, oh, and John Mayer's in the band. And so then I think what happened is, and I'm just going to call it out because he's one of my influences, uh, mentors, and et cetera, is that Irving Azoff, I believe, had a real big you know, part in that as well in terms of lifting them up. And because of his management of Mayer and making sure that this was going to be lifted up and done properly, I believe that the dead really benefited from Irving's business model over the last handful of years, which really helped lift the brand up. Then you also had the film and, you know, a handful of other moments that really brought it right back into pop culture. And I think that's really the, the key terminology there that during that time, you know, right after Fare Thee Well, the dead were able to kind of get back into pop culture, just like in 1987. And they were able to get that new generation of touch heads, right? And yeah. so <laughs> that's really, in my opinion, you know, kind of how that how that happened. And, you know, I think it is is important to know that it wasn't like this steady rise. There was a kind of lull period for them after Jerry. Um, the explosion really has happened, you know, since 2015. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting because, you know, as you mentioned before, in our day, we were trading tapes, which wasn't always the easiest thing. Like you were constantly on the hunt for, you know, X, Y, or Z show. And it was somewhat difficult to get X, Y, or Z show on cassette in good quality. Well, now this generation of fans has instant access to all 3,000 shows the dead, the Grateful Dead played. And they have instant access, if they want it, to every show as it's performed. You can even stream those shows live. You can watch them on video. So the, the access to this great music has never been as available as it is now. That's true. The one thing that, that, that they don't have access to is these, yes. which are the videos that all need to be transferred into the digital domain. And, you know, if there was one, one question I would ask, you know, David Lemieux or, or whoever is, is looking over is that the dead pro shot every show from 90, well, every stadium show was pro shot for Jumbotron. And so many of them have never been seen before. We've all seen Buffalo a hundred times, you know, yeah. and, and Alpine and, and all of those. Right. But we know because there's grainy videos of them on YouTube that there's great pro shot video of all of these, you know, the dark star from RFK, the, you know, the, the, the eyes from giants, right? Like all of those bigger shows from the late era were pro shot. The, Ru the Ruben and Charisse at the Capitol Center. Yeah. And one of my goals is actually to transfer all my tapes. I actually had them all piled up at one point and sent a photo of them to Mark Allen and a handful of people it was like, why we have to transfer all these tapes. Like there's, <laughs> cause I've been on YouTube and I know that a lot of these shows that we have are not on YouTube. Oh, not even close. And for our listeners, Jonathan's holding up VHS tapes. I got my, one bin right here that I pulled yeah. out during the holidays that I want to get transferred. But you know, I used to in college collect DAT tapes, sure. um, which I still have. And by the way, some of the the New Orleans stuff that I have on DAT is definitely not out there the way that the, the Grateful Dead stuff is, and, and needs to close. be transferred. 
But we also were super into collecting VHS tapes, my roommate and I. My roommate was a taper. We had hundreds of VHS tapes, hundreds. I still have, I think, you know, between 100 and 150. And I still am in touch with my roommate who has the rest of the collection. But I think we have a lot of stuff that's never been, you know, since the VHS times that's never been, you know, put onto into the digital domain. And who has time to do that? It's time. It's time. I, you know, I have similar, I've got a VHS tape of the radiators playing on the Tulane quad in, I think it's 1987 or 88, you know, stuff like that. I've got the meters playing at the Lone Star Roadhouse in New York City on VHS. I, I mean, there is a lot of good stuff out there that hasn't been transferred. I am I'm excited for the 50th anniversary of, of the Meters album Rejuvenation, which is coming up yeah. this year, and they're going to do a show at, at, in Civic Theater in, in New Orleans. So I'm excited for that one. I'll see you there. Hey, Jonathan, this has been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for all this today. Great insight. I could do this all day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Really appreciate it. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 